Ah yes, student teaching. For some of us, it was probably an experience we'll never forget. And for others, perhaps it's one that we're anxiously awaiting. Many student teachers go into their experience with high expectations of themselves. They look at this as their final test to see if they'll cut it out there in the real world of teaching, when in all actuality, this is their first taste of it. Therefore, it is important to examine the extent to which these individuals experience stress or burnout, as well as how personal beliefs and environmental factors may serve to enhance their stress. This is, it, this is exactly what Fives, Haman, and Oliverez decided to do. Three tests were issued to 49 student teachers completing their student teaching experience. The first assessed student teacher efficacy using the TSES, a 24 item measure asked participants to respond to the questions, how much can you do, in relation to a series of common teaching tests. The next was the Mashlack Burnout Inventory, also known as the MBI. This 22 item Likert type survey measured three indicators of burnout that we discussed in a previous study emotional exhaustion, depersonalization of students, and reduced personal achievement. The last was the Learning to Teach questionnaire, which assessed perceptions of the interaction they experience with their cooperating teacher related to classroom instru instruction. The results? The correlational analysis conducted in this study illustrated that significant relations exist among efficacy and burnout factors. When examined across time one, the start of student teaching, and time two, the completion of student teaching, we see that these relations become stronger. Moreover, the direction of these relations is such that as student teachers' levels of efficacy increase, their degree of burnout decreases. For efficacy, all participants in this study, regardless of grade level taught, demonstrated significant increases in their levels of efficacy and reported significantly less emotional exhaustion and depersonalization of students, burnout, from the start to the end of student teaching. The study also showed that student teachers perceived their university supervisors to be more autonomy supportive over time. This suggests that toward the end of the student teaching semester, these student teachers felt that their university supervisors were providing them with greater control and a stronger voice in their learning experiences. So what does all this mean? The findings seem to imply that one potential means of decreasing teachers' burnout to provide them, is to provide them with efficacy-enhancing opportunities. That is, rather than just working to decrease stressors in their teaching environment during student teaching, which may be impossible, <laughs> teacher educators should focus on providing student teachers with mastery and vicarious experiences that enhance both their teaching competency as well as their feelings of efficacy. This suggestion seems to be supported by the present finding that student teachers who reported high guidance interaction with their cooperating teachers also expressed higher levels of efficacy for instructional practice. So since guidance seems to help these students, let's take a look and see how guidance can help others. Colleges and universities are examining effective means of increasing student retention and degree completion rates. Barb Rickinson wanted to find out the value of undergraduate student counseling in this context. To do this, she sampled two groups of students at two different transitional periods in their college career, the fresh and the finished, first year students and graduating seniors. These points were chosen because their successful negotiation ra raises anxiety and for some student induces a crisis which can affect their withdrawal or completion behavior. So since Barb examined two groups, we will discuss this in two parts. Let's start with first year students. The way this study was conducted was based on data from a questionnaire survey of the undergraduate intake of autumn of 1993. Students were categorized into risk groups according to their level of commitment or risk of leaving at seven weeks into the first term. Those considered high risk were invited to attend counseling services. They were simply told, if you still feel like leaving and would like to discuss this, please enclose your name and address to the counseling service and we'll contact you. 
Of the 44 students that were identified as high risk, 15 accepted counseling services. They were offered an initial individual counseling session to explore the nature of their difficulties, a liaison with their personal tutor to explore course difficulties where appropriate, attendance at introductory workshop programs, and a review counseling session. The results? None of the 15 students in this cohort group sought further counseling from the service following their initial counseling intervention in the first year. 11 of these 15 students completed their three-year degree program and four-year degree program. Of the 15 students, 11 received cum laude honors and three achieved laude, laude honors. Now let's take a look at the senior class. Rigginson took a sample of 43 final year undergraduates. This was the same sample used in a quasi-controlled study which explored the effectiveness of a short-term counseling intervention model with final year students in reducing psychological distress. Students were administered two questionnaires. The first was a pre-counseling questionnaire which collected data on source of referral, students' definition of the presenting problem as academic, personal, or both, and their assessment of the effect that their problem was having on their academic performance on a scale of one, not at all, to four, severely. The second questionnaire was a post-counseling questionnaire which collected data on the number of times students had seen the counseled and requested them to assess changes in their academic performance on a scale of one, greatly improved, to four, deteriorated, following counseling. In addition, students were asked to assess whether counseling had assisted them to deal more effect effectively with their problems on a scale of one, yes, definitely, to four, no, definitely not. The results? 41 of these 43 students, about 95%, perceived their academic performance as having been affected by their problems prior to the counseling intervention. Of the 43 students, 39 thought that their academic performance had improved following counseling and 42 of these students recorded that counseling had assisted them to deal more effectively with their problems. All 43 students in the critical sample completed their degree program successfully. One student obtained a degree with sum laude honors, nine students received cum laude honors, and another 19 received laude honors. So what does all this mean? The findings point to the valuable con contribution with a professional counseling service can make to the following institutional goals. One, the enhancement of students' university experience. Two, the containment of students who are psychologically vulnerable. Three, the facilitation of student engagement with and successful completion of their degree program. Four, the development of an integrated institutional approach to student support and guidance. And lastly, the provision of staff development and training programs for academic staff responsible for undergraduate students to support them in their important tutorial role.